it's a big crowd. This is roughly the size of most math centers, so this is a comfortable size for me. <laughs> but uh, but I, uh, I'd like to you know see where everybody is mathematically. So um, why don't you tell me each what your background is in math? Um, maybe you're a teacher or a student. Um, so I can quickly go around and that way I can kind of curtail and talk to um, what level you might be. So. Um, I'm a sophomore teacher, just interested in math. I think I had a health one and I've dabbled with other stuff before. Okay. Uh, I'm a nurse at Allegiance Health and stats is the highest math I've had. Okay. Um, I'm Elder, probably so far. Um, I'm going to move on for um, your health and science. Cool. So. I was involved in the development of uh, CAT scans and MRI machines at uh, Siemens and uh, Fort Sam West Germany. Also, uh, General Electric and uh, low packer advanced medical systems for three dimensional Doppler ultrasounds. I just wanted to see what, uh, where you're at. Okay. I'm a science teacher here at GCC. Okay, cool. So we've got um, kind of an eclectic group and uh, I, I don't think that the math in this talk, um, whatever you don't understand, won't be essential to understanding kind of the science behind it. So, here are some of the questions I want to answer today, maybe explore a little bit, to give you an idea of how a mathematician would view an MRI machine and what role do mathematicians play. So, first of all, what does an MRI machine do? I'll briefly discuss kind of the basic little science um, and chemistry behind it, and then where do the mathematics of that come in? How does it go from a math, uh, a patient sitting underneath an MRI machine for a half hour to an image being generated on a screen? And that's where the mathematics comes in. Um, how can an MRI machine be improved? How do we improve the quality of our scans? And that's kind of a, a topic that bridges between biomedical engineering and applied mathematics. It's something um, I've had the privilege of working on with uh, several faculty at Michigan State, and I also work briefly couple summers ago at Arizona State. So um, that's something that I'm kind of involved in. Uh, and I'll discuss kind of some general topics of maybe not where I've done research, but where other mathematicians are doing their own. So this might be the non-scientific view of an MRI machine. Right? You don't really, for most patients, they don't understand exactly what's going on. They just know that it's kind of this claustrophobic area where, hey, I'm locked in here. What science is going on? inside my body. So let's talk briefly about that. So if you go online and you look up how does an MRI machine work, this is generally the outline that you'll get. First of all, our body is made up of mostly hydrogen atoms, lots of hydrogen atoms, mostly because we're 75% you know, water or whatever the percentage is. And those hydrogen atoms um, are basically a, a proton surrounded by uh, a proton and a, a neutron with one electron revolving around um, in the hydrogen atom. So, uh, or rather, if we look at the periodic table, one proton and one electron going around. So, uh, our body's mostly hydrogen atoms. And those protons can be aligned by a strong magnetic field. And then comes a radio wave pulse that causes those protons to rotate. And those rotations are basically caused by energy that's been thrusted onto each proton by the, the radio wave pulse. And then once that pulse is taken away, these, these protons with this extra induced energy relax back to their, their normal state. And that relaxation emits electromagnetic magnetic radiation. And electromagnetic radiation, basically in, in a one-dimensional view, looks like sines and cosines. And we're going to explore how those basic sines and cosines are going to turn into uh, a two-dimensional image. So the electromagnetic radiation, <coughs> which is uh, released when the protons re re are released to a, a relaxed state, those cause um, readings based on um, the emissions. And then finally, you'll see that it's transmitted back into an image that you see on the screen and that your diagnostician can then make a, a recommendation based on. So, this is kind of the general outline that you'll hear from um, most radiologists. But where does the math come in? And it comes in this last little bit. This transmitting an image from the emission um, data that's received. 
And that's kind of what I'm going to talk about today. And it's kind of a, sometimes a, a mute point when you're talking to a medical person, a medical person because this is purely mathematics. It's just turning um, some data points into a two-dimensional image. And that's what I'll explore today. So before I go into kind of the, the true mechanisms behind which um, math is involved, then I, I want to talk about some of the mathematical basics that we're going to need to understand. And hopefully this is not too difficult, it's just basic um, trigonometry, something you might have seen in a pre-calculus or an algebra course. So uh, we're going to talk mostly about sines and cosines. And first let's talk about these one-dimensional functions. So you remember sines and cosines, they look like this. And the red function is the sine curve. And the blue function is the cosine curve. Now, my advisor at MSU is actually colorblind. So I, uh, I'm always told to, well, Eric, which one is the blue curve? Which one's the red curve? Well, the blue one is the one up top. So if any of you are colorblind, the blue one has this peak at the, uh, at the top. So anyway, the, where these originally were um, discovered as highly important in signal processing, um, and where we're going to talk about this guy named Fourier, is he was actually studying in the late 18th century metal rods and heat transfer on metal rods. So if you heat two ends of a metal rod, and you see, if you assume that we have a constant heating of those two ends, how does the uh, heat then transfer through the rod and then dissipate into the surrounding area? And he actually solved the problem using just sines and cosines. And a little bit of basically what we know more than calculus 2. So by using just sines and cosines and a little bit of calculus, he solved a, a pretty complex differential equation in terms of um, for his time. And the ideas that he created 200 some years ago are actually kind of what we're going to talk about today and what goes into a, an MRI scan. So here are the sines and cosines. Now remember when I said that the electromagnetic radiation emits at various frequencies. Well just like those various frequencies um, are emitted, we can change the frequencies of these sines and cosines. So let's say I double the frequency of the cosine curve and I have the frequency of the sine curve. So now you can see just the, the relative change. And that's going to become the basis for um, how we're going to decompose a function as a sum of sines and cosines. So let's consider this function. It's called the rectangle function. And it looks like a, a relatively uninteresting example. Basically, it's just imagine you have this entire number line. And everywhere on that number line, the function is at height zero. But then in between two numbers, negative pi over two and pi over two, it achieves a height of one. So it just has this it's coming along from negative infinity, it pulses up, pulses down, continues on. Relatively boring function um, for most mathematics. However, we can write it as an infinite sum of sines and cosines. So this top summation formula um, if it looks a bit daunting to you, don't worry. All that it means is I'm going to sum cosines of various frequencies. And I'm actually going to sum infinitely many of them, which means that I never actually achieve my final term. So you can see those dot, dot, dot at the end. That means that I have infinitely many terms left. And I'm going to keep adding them until I get a good approximation of the function. Of course, we could sit here all day and try to add infinitely many of these cosine functions and we'd actually get a very good approximation. We'll never achieve a perfect reconstruction. So I want to show you this, re this what we call a decomposition, that's breaking it down into the cosines, and then the synthesis, which is putting it all back together. So here's what I do when I add just the constant, one half. Right? So we said that was at height one. So one half will put me halfway up there. Well, I'm, I'm halfway there, right? Almost. So here's when I add one cosine curve to it. So now this is 1 half plus 2 over pi cosine x. That's a, a frequency 1. So you can see it, it largely resembles the cosine curve. And then now I'm going to add another cosine curve with a bit higher frequency. And you can see there's now multiple nodes, multiple bumps. That's because I've added a higher frequency term. But we keep on going. And you can see we're getting closer and closer to the function that we wish to approximate. As we get closer and closer, we're more and more satisfied with how this curve 
could help us understand the rectangle function. But now to a mathematician, I noticed I didn't color blue the dot, dot, dot. Because to a mathematician, though, that dot, dot, dot is very important. In fact, it's almost everything. It's the difference between the blue curve and the black curve. So to a mathematician, we see this and we go, well, that's not a very good approximation. But to a medical proctologist or a medical practitioner, this is actually pretty good. So to an engineer, this looks like, hey, I could actually just break this uh, complicated function in terms of it's having this discontinuity, it's having a sharp jump into something that's actually relatively nice, which is a, a curvy cosine curve that has relatively smooth features. And that's the idea behind um, Fourier sums and behind uh, more largely MRI imaging, is that this smooth curve is going to approximate this pulse curve, this sharp, jagged one. So this is just, I wouldn't be a good mathematician if I didn't give you the, the formula by which I derived these expressions. And these are just integrals, which if um, for anybody in the room that doesn't understand what that means, that's okay. And these integrals represent inner products between a function and a cosine curve or a function of a sine curve. And it turns out that these sine ones all turn out to be zero. And that's why this representation only involved cosine curves. And it turns out that this 1 over pi turns into all these pi's in the denominators. And then this remaining integral turns into the numbers that you see, 2 over 3, 2 over 5, 2 over 7. And you get alternating signs, minus and then plus, then minus and plus. So this is kind of how a mathematician would break down this rectangle function. And you would want, not want to view it as the discontinuous pulsated curve, but as a continuous sum of sines and cosines. All right, so that's, that's for a, a one-dimensional function. And it's important to understand that that's just when I have one variable. I'm only talking about one axis, the real line. So now if I, if I go to two dimensions, then I'm talking about functions of two variables. So that means I imagine a plane, and now the height of a surface defines the dependent variable. So in these curves, our y, our height, was our dependent variable. And then our x, which runs along the real line, the x-axis, is our independent variable. But now when you go to two dimensions, you have two independent variables. And those together determine a dependent variable. So we could talk about z being our dependent variable, and now x and y are independent variables. And so just like we talked about cosine and sine curves, now we're going to talk about products of cosine and sine curves. So now this is kind of the, the three-dimensional analog of the cosine curve. So the, this is the cosine surface, the product of cosine x with cosine y. And that's the picture you get. And you can see it has this kind of hump right at the origin. And that's just like what I talked about, the cosine peaks out right when x is 0. And here's a, a more complicated, maybe a little more visually appealing curve. Uh, we're now multiplying a cosine curve of frequency 1 with a sine curve of frequency 9. And you can see, if this is the x direction, this is the, z, the y direction over here, and this is the z direction, in the y direction I have a high frequency component because I've got this 9, that's a much higher frequency. So we're going to see more oscillations in that direction, whereas in the x direction I have a low frequency component. It's not changing much as I move in that way. So let's explore this. I just want to give you a demonstration of what this looks like. Here's when I multiply a cosine 3x, so a third frequency cosine curve, with a, a first frequency y curve. So you can see in the x direction, I'm seeing these bumps going up and down. But in the y frequency, the bumps are much more gradual. They're not as quick. That's because I have higher frequency in the x direction. And if I flip it, if I put the, the third frequency on the y direction, now the high frequency bumps occur in the other direction. And I'm getting the same kind of heights, but I'm not getting them in the same direction. Well, let's see if I put them together. Now both of them have a third frequency. Then I get peaks in both directions at, three, at a frequency of three. So this is kind of how uh, cosines and sines work in, in two-dimensional functions. Or when you make it a height, now it turns into a three-dimensional image. So now let's talk about where this goes with MRI imaging. 
and with medical imaging in particular. So this translates into um, a image which is kind of visualized as a function of two variables that has a third variable as its dependent variable. So what I'm showing you here is uh, just a simple graph and its height is indicated color-wise. So a darker color towards blue indicates a low um, area height and the um, reds and yellows indicate higher heights. And now we look at this graph and it comes like, well, that doesn't really look like anything. But then let's let it rotate a little bit. And now, well, maybe it kind of looks like something. And then, oh, now it looks a little more like something I might recognize as I go down to. And indeed, it's spark. So I've turned this height function, this three-dimensional image, now into a two-dimensional image, where the height of each pixel corresponds to the color that I would get in grayscale. So a higher pixel would correspond to a lighter image, which means that essentially I need to emit more light, more energy, which gives me a brighter image. I'll color it closer to white, and in the darker regions you can see that it's of lower depth. It's a blue color. Those give me the background. So this is basically how uh, we visualize an image in grayscale terms as a three-dimensional function. We've got this 2D image, but if we want to tell me, tell me where it's dark and where it's light, I turn it into a 3D height. That's all it is. So now how does an MRI machine view this image? And I claim that it's basically like this. Now this might not look like much. Right? This kind of looks a little goofy. How does that turn into Sparty? Right? Well, what actually happens is that, remember how when we were talking about a 1D function, I said it's a sum of cosines. And each cosine had a particular value. So I had like 2 over 3 pi and 2 over 7 pi. So each cosine had a coefficient. And we said that was the relative strength. And essentially what that meant is, well, I add a cosine of one frequency. And then I add a certain multiple of a cosine of two frequencies. And then a, a certain multiple of a cosine of three frequencies. So each higher frequency gets a respective strength in the ultimate signal. I don't add one of these plus one of these. I might want add one of these plus half of the next frequency. So each frequency has a, a relative strength depending on what the actual image is. So over here, this is what an MRI machine views when it's trying to detect the image of Sparty. If Sparty were to stick his head in an MRI machine which I don't think he's going to do anytime soon. But the Fourier domain over here, as we call it, is what the MRI machine sees. And the physical domain is what the doctor sees, what we see, what comes out. And then you can translate, as I just showed you, that physical domain into an image just by simply measuring the height of each function, of each pixel. And then that gives you a, a grayscale color code. All right, so what I want to show you is what this, what an MRI machine would progressively view. So if we just look at uh, a frequency one, so that means I'm only looking at one sinusoidal surface. Over here in the physical domain, that's what it would translate into. So I'm, I'm saying, look at what are the frequency one. So multiply cosine of x with cosine of y, and cosine of x with sine of y. And look at how those sinusoidal surfaces would contribute to this physical domain image. So you see when I have low frequencies, I'm only adding a, a small number of surfaces, then I get a relatively smooth surface. There's not much jagged imagery. But then as I add more frequencies, I'm adding more sinusoidal surfaces to it, I get a more jagged structure. Where you can see it just protruding out, we're getting higher and higher, and we're also getting more and more jagged features. When we go up to frequency 100, that means I'm adding everything with frequencies including up to and including, up to and including 100. And then we go up to the maximum frequency, which is determined by the number of pixels in the Sparty image I chose, which is 207. And now this, we can see this is the original image that we had of Sparty, Sparty and these are the coefficients. So now if I, if I could zoom in here, you would see that the lower frequencies have a higher predominance in this image. 
and the higher frequencies, they tend to zero out. So as I extend out to higher and higher frequencies, those don't appear in the image as much, which is typical of, of most images. And we have low frequencies dominating and higher frequencies kind of coming out, and they're, they're not as present. And that corresponds to this kind of image, the more and more I add. So now I want to show you what, that, what all of these images actually produced on, let's say, our, our doctor's screen. How does this turn into an image? How does that one turn into an image? And, and so forth. So if I add, let's say, up to frequency one, this was my sinusoidal surface. And over here I have this, this image generated. And it really doesn't look like much. It's just basically bland. It's mostly dark. There's not much going on. So we obviously can't tell much with just this simple sinusoidal surface. But now if I add up to five frequencies, fre frequency five surfaces, then I get a a little bit of what we might see. It's kind of like if you uh, see Sparty without your glasses on. And then we go up to frequency 10. Well, now I'm kind of seeing his, his background image. And we go up to frequency 20, you can see that it's, it's relatively good. Frequency 40, getting better. We can actually detect what he is now. And then here's frequency 100. And it looks pretty clear. And now if I go up to frequency, say, 207, I said that was the maximum I could go up to you can't really tell any difference. And I promise you I'm not putting on the exact same picture. I even checked it. I zoomed in real close. And there's actually a little bit of distortion in this one versus this one. And the, the moral to take away from this is that to uh, an engineer, this looks just good enough. This is fine. I don't need to add up 270, um, 207 frequency sinusoidal surfaces to get the image that I want. I can reduce it back to 100. And this is kind of uh, a major area of study in mathematics. Where do I cut it off? And the idea is, how much information do I need in order to generate an MRI image? And we could obviously get better images by collecting more information, but that would mean that the patient would have to sit there longer, the machine would have to work for long, for long periods of time, and that wouldn't really behoove anybody if the, the image is not going to get any clearer. So understanding the mathematics behind that is an important step in um, determining uh, what medically is needed. So unfortunately, generating MRI images is not as easy as I may have led you to believe at this point. Just like interpreting them is not so easy. Wouldn't be so clear cut. And uh, how am I kind of telling you a lie? There's kind of a less than ideal reality behind MRI images. And I'm going to explore that right now. So what I've told you is that we add these sinusoidal surfaces. And notice of all the frequencies I've discussed thus far, they were always integers, meaning there were the whole numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. And over here on this grid, that's essentially what you would look like. So imagine each one of this is like 0, and then 1, 2, 3, 4. And I can go in an x direction, or a y direction, right, up or down, or left or right. And those would correspond to higher or lower frequencies in the x direction and the y direction. And if I add sinusoidal surfaces uh, of those simple frequencies, it's relatively easy to get the images you want. However, this is not the kind of data that an MRI machine receives. This is the kind of data that an MRI machine receives. And lurking behind these frequencies are non-integer values. And you can see there's actually a clustering near zero. And you can see why that's a good thing, because if you remember back to our image or back here, most of the data was centered right near the zero frequency, which means that the low frequencies were predominant in our image. And that's kind of why biomedical engineers, they choose this style of imaging over this, because it gives you more information where you probably want it. And in the, lower, in the higher frequencies where information is not as important, there's a little bit more sparsity. Well, a little more sparsity, as they call it in mathematics. And this kind of behooves the, the um, data and the style of um, mathematics that's behind it. But in terms of generating an image from these data points, it's much harder. I can't just add up surfaces as I did in this example with Sparty. I just added up these surfaces, and I got this image over on the main side. But now when I have these, style data points. They're not in this nice grid fashion. 
And adding them up now doesn't make sense mathematically. And the difficulty of that is now we have to get, use these complex integrals. And they're much more um, unmanageable. And they don't behave as, as nicely as you'd like. They don't give you the same style of information. And you can't just simply add them back up in what we call that sum, that sigma notation. Now, that doesn't uh, actually behoove us mathematically um, in order to generate an image. So you have to kind of undo this complicated, what they call Fourier transform. Before, we were talking about Fourier series. And here, we're talking about Fourier transform. So what are some of the advantages? I've kind of given this a bad name now. But one of the advantages is data collection is much, much quicker. So instead of the, you can imagine this involves um, a, if you imagine the, a machine kind of spiraling outward, that's not actually what it's doing. But it's able to collect frequencies much more continuously. Here, the, the frequencies are in this grid-like fashion. They, they can't be collected as easily. And it really would not be um, feasible for a machine to do this. So uh, data collection is much quicker for this reason. Um, image quality is less sensitive to measurement error. So if I have um, some misinformation in my samples here, let's say I had samples here, versus some misinformation here, then this would be much more sensitive to noise, that, that misinformation, which is basically due to the fact that I've got lots of high frequencies up here. Whereas here, the high frequencies aren't as present. There's a lot more sparsity up here. And the high frequencies, remember, had lower coefficients. So if we look back at this, if I have some error in here, it's OK. Because some error doesn't appear as drastic, because there's already a lot of information. There's a lot of strength there. Whereas if I have some error out here, maybe I get some peak that I didn't actually want. So it's basically saying, well, if I already have a lot, then a little error doesn't look like much. But if I have nothing, then a little error looks like quite a bit. And that basic idea means that when I have more information concentrated in the middle, then whatever information that is kind of erroneous, whatever misinformation I have, whatever error, that's what's called in mathematics, whatever error or noise, doesn't affect the overall quality of the image as much. So we'll go back to the screen. And then finally, there are many mathematical methods that can be used to reconstruct the image once we have samples of this nature, this non-uniform samples. And this is where the applied mathematicians come in and they say, let's start here. And we'll say that we have some measurement error, some noise, and we're going to try to reconstruct a quality image, something that's this quality, given this data. Now, the current methods have been in MRI imaging have, have stood for quite a while. And it's kind of a, an active area of research that um, I've had the pleasure of working with that uh, mathematicians are trying to prove, uh, improve upon the current methods that are used in MRI machines today. So there are a lot of, um, kind of budding research areas and budding techniques that uh, could be applied to um, use this style of data, this non-uniform style, as opposed to the uniform. And that's something that's challenging mathematically. And as has been the, the history of mathematics, it's kind of been motivating new styles uh, or new branches of mathematics and new um, things that maybe not are not of interest to uh, a medical community, but are of interest just to mathematicians. And it was all motivated by um, a medical problem to begin with, an engineering problem. So now I've, I've talked a little bit about um, why this style of imaging, this non-uniform, is preferred over the uniform, why it's used. And now I want to talk about some of the, the specific aspects that a mathematician will talk about and study when um, he or she is looking at medical imaging as from an applied mathematician's perspective. So uh, this is kind of what I've talked about before, using samples of non-integer, non-uniform frequencies to predict the value of integer values of the Fourier transform. And essentially what that means is, how can I turn this data into this data? So there are kind of two um, beliefs that you could go on. Maybe I, the, best, the best way to handle this 
bad style data, is turn it into the good style data and then use that. Or there's the other kind of ideology. Maybe I'll start with the bad data and go directly to the image. And those two different ideologies, the two different methods will guide you into two different um, branches of mathematics. And how are you going to handle uh, those two different um, styles of, of data, data collection will dictate what kind of mathematics you need to use. Uh, then um, another area of research, directly inverting the non-integer frequencies to obtain the image. That's what I just mentioned. I can start with the bad kind of data and then go directly to the image as opposed to turning the bad data into the good data. Um, now this is the kind of uh, style, uh, this is the area of research that I've spent most time on, which is developing methods to reconstruct an image that reduce the effects of noise, the effects of measurement error. So we try to assume that there's a lot of error that's present in our data, and how can we uh, develop a method that will reconstruct an image that even given that large amount of error in our measurements, uh, produces an image that's still quality and still is recognizable to the eye. That's, that's something I've spent time on. Um, and then last, adapting current methods to perform with similar quality but fewer samples. So let's say I didn't have data that was way out here in the boonies. Let's say I didn't have all of this data out here. I just had this center. Is there still a way that I could generate an image that maybe is not as detailed, not as sharp? but would still provide uh, a medical professional with the inf information that he or she needs to make a diagnosis. And uh, defining that mathematical cutoff, that threshold of where do I need data and where, do I, where don't I need data, will kind of guide the, the future engineering of, of MRI machine. So uh, I'll, I'll spend uh, a few minutes just talking about this third point. It's something that I've worked on. And I'm going to throw kind of a lot of math mathematical symbology at you. Um, and essentially all this means is, let's say I have samples, and I'm given some samples with, that no with noise. And I say, I think there's some error. I don't believe these samples exactly. I don't trust them. But I know that they're relatively close to the true values. I say, I've got this data that the MRI machine gave me, but it gave it to me with some level of error. Now how do I turn that back into an image? And an image that some medical professional is going to use to diagnose um, maybe a small tumor or something else of interest to the patient. Very important stuff. Well, if I have that some amount of error, then my goal is to somehow reduce the effect of that error while still returning the image. And this is uh, the model that um, is is developed for that, and one thing I've looked at and studied quite a bit. And uh, explaining it all maybe a bit too gross in detail, but uh, essentially here is the data that you're given that's called C. And this A is what we call a Fourier transform operator. So this A turns the C, the data that the MRI machine gives you, into the image. So let's say that image was Sparty. C was the data you got. A is the mathematical operation that turns C into the image. And is C a data point or is it the whole set of data? C, C is the whole set of data. Okay. You can think of these as, if you know something about vectors, and it's this A is like a matrix and this C is a vector. Okay. Thank you. Yep. And this G would be uh, the data that you, or, I'm sorry, this G is the samples that you would see, then the C is the uh, the surface that you're, the image that you're trying to reconstruct. So if I'm given G, and I say, well, let me try to guess what C is, then I'm going to try to solve this minimization. I won't go into how that's done, but I want to try to produce C such that it's relatively close to the, the information I received, and I don't want this term to be too large. And what all that this term means is that I don't want the variation, it's called the total variation, I don't want the variation in C to be too great. And all the variation measures is how much does something change. So when I transition from this blue up to this red, that's a, a drastic change. And the idea is, aside from these drastic changes from like blue up to red, there's not much change overall. So once I'm in the red area, 
I'm going to stay relatively at the same height until I transition back down into the blue. So as I run across the image of Sparty, then I'm only going to jump from the blue to the red when I hit, say, the top of this half. And then I stay relatively at the same image, the color, until I jump back down. And so, yeah. Is it changed just relative to the points that are contiguous to it? Or is it changed relative to all the points in the, in the image? Uh, well, it, it's changing relative to the points that are close to it. Okay. So the, the claim with the assumption in total variation, the, that model, is that when I run across an image in any direction, I'm only going to see sharp jumps. I'm not going to see gradual changes. So when I run across, let's say I go across this, I see this gradual change, or this, this no change here, a sharp change here, a sharp change here, <coughs> and then no change further on. And so what the total variation model does is it encourages sharp changes, and it reduces gradual changes. So a gradual change would be if I have, say, I'm going from blue up to red very slowly. But as you can see in this picture, that doesn't really happen. So you're assuming that that's an error. If you have a gradual change, that's probably that's, an that's error. That's absolutely correct. Okay. Yep. And so it tries to eliminate gradual changes. And the idea is with images, that's hopefully true. The gradual changes are not very present. And if you look at most grayscale images, especially those with MRI, those have sharp changes. You're going to see a skull, and you'll see the brain inside that. And within a certain bodily structure, it stays the same color, the same scale of grayscale. But as you move through that image, you're going to see those sharp jumps from a black area to a white area. And it's really those sharp jumps that you want to detect. Maybe not the blurry, fuzzy distinctions inside a single lot of structure. Edge detection is used to, to determine those things. That's right. Yep. Yep. So uh, that's some of the stuff that I've worked on. Um, and it's kind of just a, a give you a little taste of maybe what an applied mathematician would do um, if he, he or she were working in the um, medical field and working with biomedical engineers some of the things they kind of talk about. And these are the mathematical techniques that would kind of branch off into either you're going to look at how you would curtail an MRI machine in the future to adapt and use these methods, or more from a mathematical perspective, how you're going to um, further the field of mathematics in these directions. Yeah? Well, one of the tricks is when you're acquiring the data is, like you were saying, how do you know if this data is true or not? does not have any noise or artificial injected uh, images in there because uh, <coughs> the development of some of these things when they're improving the technology it just happens and what you're doing is help improve the overall techniques that are used right. <coughs> and that happened in CAT scans and, and, and MRI uh, are you primarily working in medical, or do you do like metallurgy? Because they use MRIs for fault tolerance. No, I'm, I'm mostly working with mathematicians. And the, the actual, uh, especially in academia, the actual connection between a mathematician and the medical field is, is somewhat distant. And it kind of takes um, a, a grant or two to push that connection forward. And so most of my work has been with mathematicians and not actually talking to a medical profession, which has its advantages and disadvantages. Uh, but then when you actually talk about the connection, that can somewhat take a while to make. And the actual changes that occur in medical imaging will, will take many years. And uh, especially when you're working in academia and at the university or college level, uh, that connection gets slowed down as opposed to working in a private sector. Well, if, if you Looking at a specific problem, well, for instance, if you use some sonar techniques, what can happen is, is the, the gray areas on the outside, what happens is they, they determine, they use this also in image processing for space applications. Is where you, you can take the bottom third of all the noise there and just elevate the upper part of your, your image here. And what happens is all the background goes away and your image goes pops right out. And similar things are done for uh, tumor development, what you call anatomy of a tumor. 
MIT are working on that for those processes. Any questions? Comments? So that, I just wanted to give you a taste of what I do on a daily basis. Um, maybe this is the, the future for um, the visionaries out there. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. I, I don't either. <laughs> I'll drive. But thank you for listening, and um, I'll open the floor to questions now if you have uh, anything at all. I'm, I'm happy to answer. Yeah. What are some um, other noise reduction techniques that you use, you said that's what you specialize in? Well, uh, there are many different filters, and they're, they're based on um, kind of different families of functions. There's something called wavelet filtering, and wavelets are, um, well, one form of a wavelet is the sines and cosines family, but there are many different families of functions, like the sines and cosines, that wavelets can be um, built from, and you can kind of filter you can filter out uh, certain frequencies of those different functions to try to reduce um, noise. So when, for instance, I said that an image doesn't have very many high frequency um, co components, right? The low frequencies are dominant. Well, if I see something that's very high frequency, then I think, well, it's probably not uh, a true component of my image. It's an artifact. So what you can do is you can decompose your function, your image, into uh, kind of a superposition of these different uh, functions. These like sines and cosines are different functions depending on the wavelet family that you're choosing. And you can say, well, I'm going to eliminate the high frequency ones. So I decompose it, and then I get rid of the high frequency stuff. Now I'm left with a subset of that original function, and then I perform the synthesis back up to the original image. And now what, you've get, what you get is hopefully an improvement that you've eliminated that higher frequency part that probably was an artifact. And maybe you eliminated some of the, the actual component of the image with it, but maybe that wasn't important. And hopefully it, it, the benefit outweighed the, the loss. So no matter what family of functions you pick, pretty much what you're doing is trying to filter out high frequency? Uh, I, I won't make that broad of a statement. <laughs> But um, but probably yes, with most cases that you do. And you're not going to be looking at too strange of functions. Generally, wavelets are very simple and very nice. So, yeah. And you introduce a power spectrum um, model to that, those images, because what that will happen is it'll get rid of the noise and it'll bring up the true image that is there. So, like, decomposing it into this kind of height here and analyzing which components are high and which are low. Yeah. Typically it's used for image processing where they uh, you know, do analysis, do the average level of the right. power spectrum <coughs> and the heights that will, will come out and you subtract everything else out, you just left the like, uh, top tier which you're right. looking at. Right. And, and, and that is something that uh, we have looked at the problem is though that we start we always start our data go back we always start here mm -hmm. so we assume that our data is over here and there's kind of two things that you can do you can either start here manipulate the data to try to curtail it to what you want or you can move it over to here and then adjust the the information and most of what I've done is trying to start here and then manipulate the data over here so that when you come over here, it's uh, a better image. So I think it's going to be primarily, it's very specific to the application. Right. It's not going to be general. Right. Yeah. So most of the, the techniques that we explore are, are geared towards the application of, of imaging, signal processing, where all these components that I've described are very common. And very Other questions? So, um, in a picture where you have, um, you're saying you're going to encourage the sharp contrast, yep. right? But um, sharp contrast means high frequency, right? So. Right, to some level. So you, you do need high frequency components to have the sharp contrast. As you can see, the higher frequency we go, the, the sharper we get.
the, the thing that I'm that this model encourages though is not eliminating these high frequencies, but instead when I come back over here, then eliminating the, the gradual changes. So the idea is that with the TV model, you, you're first looking at the data in the Fourier domain, so where you have high frequencies. And then you're translating it all at once over to the physical domain. So the idea is that it is true that the high frequencies produce those sharp images, but if you can do the translation from the, the transition from the Fourier domain into the physical domain all at once, then you don't need to worry about filtering out anything. You just encourage things by putting on this total variation term, which essentially just encourages high frequency or high discontinuities and discourages low gradual changes. Then if you can perform this transition once there's no filtering involved. Does that make sense? Other questions? Well, if not, thank you very much for listening. Thank you.